Hello, everyone. You're watching Afghanistan by Afghans. Very happy that you have come on board and to check out yet another episode and get to meet another Afghan. Uh, today, I'm very excited to be speaking with Zahira or Zahira, the westernized version, uh, as she would call it herself. Um, she studied political science, uh, women and gender studies, and then went on to get a master's in the arts. Um, and currently helps uh, as an NGO in Ottawa, Canada, with the recently arrived refugees and a lot more. I kind of came across her work seeing some of her um, artwork actually on social media and elsewhere, and I was like, oh, I got to speak with her. Uh, a little bit of calligraphy. So uh, Persian or Dari or Farsi calligraphy is uh, one of the oldest arts in that region. So uh, we're going to be also chatting about that. So without further ado, welcome. Zahira Jan to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, so let's start kind of, you know, the structure of the show. You've heard a few episodes. Uh, <laughs> um, tell, tell us a little bit about uh, your journey or your family's journey from Afghanistan to Ottawa. So my journey actually starts in Pakistan. Uh, that's where I was born. And we immigrated to Saudi Arabia shortly after. And that's actually where I grew up. But we would always go back to Afghanistan every summer or every opportunity we had. Um, we still had a lot of family who lived in Afghanistan and you know throughout the country. So it was important for my parents to keep that connection so that we grew up, you know, knowing where we came from, but um, also just keeping in touch with the family who were still there. And so when I was nine years old, we actually came to Canada. And even then we still went back, uh, not as often because it's a little bit farther away than when you're in Saudi Arabia, it's like just one or two flights away. Whereas now in Canada, it's like three or more flights away. <laughs> and so we'd go back every two to three years. And uh, that connection was still very important for my parents to maintain. And we still have family there. And so, that's that's a, a bit of our journey. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. Uh, I sp I've spoken to a few people actually who were born in Pakistan neighboring country and there's a huge uh, uh, number of refugees there, the largest being in Pakistan and Iran. Um, how did your family end up in Pakistan? Were they one of the refugees moving from Afghanistan to Pakistan or, or what, why did they move? Uh, so we had been there for a while before like when my mom was very young she was there and um like my grandmother was there my mom's siblings were all there um i wouldn't call them refugees per se because they they weren't uh, forced to move there but i guess in a general sense you know with the war and whatnot mm -hmm. it was safer for them to leave before things got worse so you know mm -hmm. In a way, they were kind of refugees, but thankfully, we didn't have to experience some of the hardships that most Afghans experienced when they were forced to flee and go to either Pakistan or Iran. Right, right. No, that's yeah, that's wonderful. And and so when you came with your family to Ottawa, how was life growing up in Ottawa as a eight <laughs> or nine year old? Uh, it was very challenging when we first came to Ottawa. So Ottawa is the capital city of Canada. It's very close to Toronto, which seems to be the main spot that people can identify when you speak about Canada. They think, okay, Toronto. And so, Vancouver too. Yeah, exactly. Like those are the only two cities that exist. So Ottawa is very close to Toronto. And there were not very many immigrants here when we came in the 90s. Um, like there were probably two or three other Afghan families in Ottawa at the time, and we knew them. And, uh, you know, it was not a very diverse part of town either. Um, like there was a lot of French Canadians in the area that we lived. And mm -hmm. there were probably more Arabs than there were Afghans or even Iranians or Pakistanis at the time. So it looked a lot different than it does today. Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy to say there's a lot more Afghans. Like now you could go to any grocery store and you'll likely hear someone speaking Farsi or Pashto, or mm -hmm. you can just tell by their clothing that, you know, they're from the motherland. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> um, yeah, before I go get to, I was going to talk about your master's and, and the arts. 
what sort of arts were you exposed to as a child? Because now, you know, you are a practicing artist. Um, yeah, whether it was, I, I'm thinking maybe even back in Saudi Arabia or Pakistan and then to Ottawa, what sort of arts were you around? <clears throat> so it was mostly visual arts. Um, mm -hmm. There is no one in my family I can think of who was ever directly an artist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not a profession that's m encouraged in a lot of immigrant families. You know, there's not so much stability in the arts mm -hmm. field, you know, whether it's music or visual arts or dancing. And so for me, it was something I always did as a hobby. Uh, it's I always had a sketchbook. I was always doodling or drawing. Everyone in the family knew me as the artsy one. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was just something I naturally always fell to, whether I was happy or upset. Like if I was just having a bad day, I would just pull out my sketchbook and start doodling anything that came to my mind. And mm -hmm. so it's mostly sketching and drawing that I did. Mm -hmm. um, I like to draw faces and portraits of people. And so eventually I spent a period of time where I didn't draw. Um, mm -hmm. When I was in university, there was no time for drawing. There was no time for hobbies or anything on the side. Uh, between work and school and family, it all consumed my time. So for about, I'd say almost 10 years, I didn't draw. And it was wow. actually after I had children and uh, drawing and coloring with them kind of like reconnected me with the things I did when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And it just reminded me how much joy there was in coloring and drawing and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so uh, just over a year ago, I started my business where I do illustrations professionally. Mm -hmm. And right. that's how I reconnected with my passion. That's wonderful. We will get to talk about your business. I, I heard somebody play the piano in the background. Is that one of your kids, maybe? Oh, yeah. probably. <laughs> <laughs> I heard something. They're 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 taking a this yeah, they're probably running play. around upstairs too, making noise. <laughs> making that, that's great. Um, so I I know you would eventually study, you know, get your master's in the arts, but what made you go into a political science and, and women and gender studies to begin with? Uh, I guess a passion for politics and social justice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, growing up, I was always encouraged to pursue something like law or medicine or something in science or, you know, at, at the very least, like something with international development. And so for me, political science was the gateway into that world. And actually, after I completed my poli-sci degree, I went back to work in Afghanistan for a, a short period. Um, I worked for a, a German organization, and we focused on microfinance loans for women-led businesses. Mm -hmm. And we worked uh, up north in Badakhshan. So when you look at the map of Afghanistan and there's that little stretch of land reaching to one side, that's where I worked. And it was a wonderful opportunity to connect with the people there and just see how NGOs were supporting the Afghan population and helping them to become more self-sufficient. And it's not an easy field by any means um, because I was there alone. It was very lonely. You know, you have your work friends and whatnot, but after work, it's just, it's not the same as when you come here, you know, in the West, after work, you get together with friends for, you know, a meal or whatever. Um, there was a lot of loneliness over there. So I, I didn't stay very long. Um, How long were you there for? Uh, maybe six months tops. It wasn't long at all. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the loneliest birthdays I spent there too. Mm -hmm. Um but, you know, we, we did a lot of wonderful things. You can see how hardworking the Afghan people were when they were given the opportunity to make their lives better. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very thankful for that opportunity. And that's actually why I came back to pursue a master's degree, because I figured, you know, I had a taste of what can be done over there. Maybe if I get my master's, I can continue some sort of work to help the people there, but from over here. Mm hmm. Oh, wow. OK. And and so mm -hmm. then why Master of Arts? You... <laughs> uh, so actually, when I 
applied for my master's, I didn't have all the credits required to get into that program. It was a master of women's and gender studies. Mm -hmm. And so because I worked in the microfinance field um, to help women uh, entrepreneurs in Afghanistan, I wanted my focus to be on that. Right. And so they told me, you don't have enough credits to get into this program. You need to do another honors degree. And I was so bummed out because I'm like, you're telling me I have to do another four years of university. Oh. And they're like, no, 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 let's let's figure something out. So I ended up combining some of my elective credits with what I had currently uh, already completed under my poli sci degree. They created another honors degree for me. <laughs> so that's why I have two BA honors. So I had my women's studies honors degree and that's what helped me get into the master's program. Mm, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And so when you were in the master's program in the arts, I was building up your master's for the arts. And then you totally basically <laughs> said, OK, well, that was a second choice. <laughs> you should definitely. No, I, I was joking on that. But um, what sort of uh, classes were you exposed to uh, when you did your master's for arts other than the so, two majors, the pre majors? So the master's of arts program was a focus on women's and gender studies. Um, a lot of it was about learning theoretical work in the first year. And then in your second year, you do your research and you work on your thesis. And so that's when I uh, focused on Orientalism and the work of Edward Said. And I used his analysis and framework to critique feminist, frame, uh, feminist work that was being studied in university. And so the reason why I was drawing attention to this was because at the time, Afghanistan was under a lot of uh, a heavy Western lens. Like there was always something to do with Afghanistan on the news. Um, you know, the, a lot of Western troops were there. There was a lot of international uh, aid going into Afghanistan. But I didn't appreciate how some of the Western feminists were using war to speak about Afghan women. Um, and so that's where my my work came in, just to amplify Afghan voices. And that's actually the theme in my art now, too. Um, it's, you know, there's a it's there's a difference between speaking for people and providing a space for people to speak in their own voices. And so that's a theme that was uh, brought up a lot in my academic work. And I noticed that one of the problems that was, uh, I, I noticed predominantly in that field was, these are great discussions for us to have and they're very important for people to know them, but they were just taking place in a university classroom. So I figured like, let me think of a way where I can take this information and make it accessible to a wider audience. And mm -hmm. art is a great visual way to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, after having my kids and whatnot and reconnecting with art and drawing, I went back to what I studied in university and I combined the two and that's the work that I do now today. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's beautiful. What a what a journey to uh, that, what a creative way to combine it all. That's, yeah, <laughs> that is beautiful. Yeah, in in many ways, I think uh, as I hear you, um, I think that as as Afghans, uh, of course, the, the concept of you know having a place, give amplifying their voices versus speaking for them is 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 there. But at, at also another point is like no matter what we pursue, there is that social element of where we come from that always carries with us. I think the social justice mindset, right? Because yeah. you are coming from a place which is destabilized and is constantly in, in a struggle to stabilize itself. So in many ways, no matter what the Afghans are doing, they're always thinking of social justice, uh, yeah. I feel, um, in, in one way or the other. So now getting to your, your, your work that you've combined it all, uh, tell us, yeah, what was the, uh, you already said about the inspiration. Tell us about some of the products that are coming out from your organization. I saw stickers and I want to talk <laughs> about calligraphy, but yeah, tell me how, yeah, what are some of the products that are out right now? Yeah, so with my illustrations, I create products. So I mostly do stationery. So I have things like notepads, 
um, one of my really popular and first items I came out with was my educational coloring book. So it's a coloring book, a coloring book called Global Adventures. And the idea behind that is to take people on a visual journey through the Middle East and Central Asia. And so there's a, a page, a drawing, and underneath each page, there's one sentence of information just describing the page. And so these coloring books, when I first uh, created them and designed them, I had children in mind because I figured if we're going to talk about educating people, let's start at a young age, like let's slowly expose them to diversity so that these things become normal to them. And so that if they ever hear something that's inaccurate or false or very racist, they can say, hey, that's not true. But surprisingly, the coloring books are getting more popular amongst the elderly. Um, oh, really? Yeah, I actually had a, another business approach me and um, they create little gift boxes for senior citizens. So people who are 50 plus and so each box is a little bit different. And so she was telling me how Alzheimer's and um, other cognitive delays and illnesses can impact seniors. And coloring is a great way for them to uh, exercise their brain so that you know their, their mind is still working. And so they don't lose uh, some of the abilities they have. And so I was just very taken aback by that. Like senior citizens were not even on my radar, but it just goes to show that when you create a product with one person in mind, there's a potential that it could be popular amongst anyone. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. No, that's very true. I, I mean, these uh, meditation coloring books have become very popular among oh, yeah. young adults. Um, uh, what are they called? I can't think of them. Zen meditation books yeah. or something. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, Coloring books for adults. Maybe really that's detailed medellas and whatnot. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very meditative to paint and, and all of that, of course. It's very um, therapeutic. It gets your mind off of anything that's taking up your, your thoughts. That's so true. That's so true. <laughs> uh, other than the stickers, which, which are also some cute ones, I like <laughs> the little kids sitting and all of those other ones, which I would recommend audience go and check some of these stickers out. Um, I saw there that you had a calligraphy, uh, Persian slash Arabic words calligraphy. Um, yeah. Where did you pick up calligraphy? Where did you learn it? So to write? I actually learned to write in Arabic when we lived in Saudi Arabia. Right. Um, so Arabic was a language I learned uh, around the same time I learned English, but my English was not so great at the time. So actually a lot of my friends were uh, Middle Eastern. So not just Saudi, but there were a lot of Kuwaitis, mm. um, a lot of Iraqis. And so between our broken English and a bit of Arabic and our hand gestures, like we were able to communicate quite well. And um, so in school I learned Arabic and like every day you write your name in Arabic, you, you have a full lesson in Arabic. I guess in the US, you guys would have Spanish. In Canada, we have French. French. Yeah. Yeah. So there was just one class dedicated to Arabic. And then, you know, when you're in Saudi Arabia, Arabic is all around you. So you're constantly reading signs in Arabic and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. like it's just on your mind. So, right, right, right. Yeah. Well, so that's writing, how I learned it. That's how you learn it. Well, writing, uh, scribbling is of course one thing i every anybody <laughs> could write in any language the yes. other is to 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 kind of write beautifully which is calligraphy yeah. um how did you learn to to do calligraphy you know it's still a work in progress i don't want to say i've perfected it by any means right um because when you write it your hand kind of gets used to the curves and the mm -hmm. the sways of the letters mm -hmm. and so when I do calligraphy, I do it on my iPad. So it's not even the same as traditional calligraphy where they use an angled pen. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I use like a regular eye pencil when oh I do God. it. Okay. There... Yeah, and then I just kind of experiment until to me it looks nice. Um, but everyone has their own style as well. Yeah. So do you know also how to use the nai, which is the curved pen? Have you used it? So the only time I've ever used it was to write in 
English calligraphy, so like medieval oh, lettering. Uh -huh. I've never actually written Arabic or Persian letters with that. <laughs> Wow. Wow. So you're yeah. full on digital artist. Uh, yes. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and I saw that, you know, you write the words, but of course you, you kind of take it in and, and, and turn them into flowers and other sketches uh, to yeah. beautify the letters. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Beautiful. And do people do custom orders with that as well? Like they, they say, write my name and uh, things like that. Is that, or custom letters? Do you so get any have... requests for that? Yeah, I have um, a series of initial wall art. So just yes. like the first letter of your name. And when I offer that to people, I offer it in either English or Arabic or Dari even. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, they can select the letter. Mm -hmm. And for my other products, like I had some sweaters a while back with the word sabr, so patience. Mm -hmm. And part of the word had the drawing of a butterfly as well so i do some of that like for myself not so much for custom work right, right but in terms of custom work it's the initial art that i offer that's wonderful that's very wonderful and um and besides your artwork of course you were involved with the um refugees yes. and, and and a lot have come to canada so tell me a little bit about how did you get started to be part of that organization um, and, and kind of start that journey of helping newly arrived Afghans. Yeah, so after last August, when the tragedies unfolded in Afghanistan, uh, I, as well as many other people, were watching everything unfold through social media or the news. And it was just heartbreaking. It was absolutely devastating to see what was happening there. And for me personally, having worked there, having seen the progress that was made just, you know, in the span of 10 years even, um, it was just so devastating to know that everything that happened there happened for no reason. And I think I fell into a, a, a bit of a depression for a little bit. You know, it was just so heartbreaking. You think about your family who are still there and friends and colleagues, you know, you wonder what's going to happen to them. And so uh, there was a group of Afghans here who just, they rallied, like they were a very small group. I think there must have been about four or five of them at the beginning. And they said, you know what, this is devastating. But Canada, our federal government at that time had announced that they will take in 40,000 Afghan refugees over the next few years. And so we figured if all these new people are coming in, Getting to Canada is step one of many um, of the challenges that they will experience in their lives. And so some of the families will have dealt with PTSD, um, you know, other types of traumas. Some of them don't speak English. Some of them are just separated from their families or they came here with nothing but the clothes on their back. So we were thinking of how we can help these people and channeling our emotions into something more productive that could benefit the people that we're worried about. And so I actually joined the Afghan Canadian Support Network uh, at the end of September, 2021. Mm -hmm. They had been already doing some work prior to that. I think they started getting together. It must have been right at the end of August. And so just as soon as you join the group, you're everyone just their their hearts are in the right place they want to do some good it's a volunteer group no one gets paid for the work that we do and we all have full-time jobs we have families children and we're all afghan there's nine of us now and i think for a lot of us we see a little bit of our families or our loved ones in the families that we help and so having that connection and being able to relate to some of the hardships they're experiencing has allowed us to uh, figure out ways that we can support them. And so we help them with finding employment here in Ottawa, um, finding housing, uh, furniture for their homes, helping them enroll their children in schools. Uh, we even offer care packages to people who need it, who have no clothing, or if they have babies and infants, um, and they need diapers or formula, we can provide that. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a what a major shift 
between the previous generations and, and now, because I think when your family moved and others who moved in the past 20, 30, 40 years, they didn't have that support network. That's right. Um, and you guys are able to kind of turn around and create that support network, which is which is very exemplary. And I've seen it in many other cities as well. I mean, I'm sure you are also aware of it. Um, yeah. Afghans from across the US and Canada are kind of trying to create these groups, support groups um, for the refugees, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, any specific story from these recent refugees uh, has stuck with you that you would like to share any sort of story, whether it's inspirational, whether it's about <laughs> their resilience, uh, anything that they have shared with you that you would like to share with us? Oh my goodness. There are just so many. Um, you have to think of one. <laughs> If I have to think of one that's inspirational, that's not sad. <laughs> yeah, that's why I said it showcases the resilience of our of people. <laughs> um, you know what? This this didn't happen to a family I helped. I heard it through someone else actually. Um, there was a family who they the, uh, it was a husband and a wife. They just had an infant, and around the time that there was the explosion at the Kabul airport. Um, and a lot of families were separated or they had passed away. This family, uh, they got separated from their infant. I think they they passed the infant to someone else to hold while they were helping someone. Eventually, it was their turn to get on an airplane to be airlifted, but they didn't have their infant with them. And it wasn't until uh, they went to a different country at one of the camps where they keep the families temporarily before they're brought to Canada. I think they were like asking everyone, like, has anyone seen this infant? It's a, I don't remember if it's a boy or a girl, but it was a baby under the age of one. And it wasn't until they came to Canada that they were reconnected with their baby. Wow. And when you hear these kinds of stories, it just gives you goosebumps. Cause you think like, you know, as a parent, I'm a mother. So for me to be separated from a, my baby, I, I don't even know how I would live a day if I was in that situation. And this family survived many days, many hundreds of kilometers away from their infant. Mm. And miraculously, they were reconnected with their baby. Mm. And so you just know, like, that baby has so much luck on their side. Like, that's a miracle right there. <laughs> miracle baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a beautiful story. That's a beautiful story of resilience. Yeah, I mean, of what... Uh, people have gone and, and gone through. Um, well, I definitely appreciate your time for coming in on the show and and sharing these stories and your own personal story, which had so many multi layers. I didn't know there were so many layers to it um, as we <laughs> as we chatted before briefly. Um, and uh, you know, one thing that comes to mind from your type of work is really you going back into your community and helping out. I know there are many organizations out in many different cities helping the recently arrived refugees, which I hope the audiences are inspired to go help, whether they're Afghan or not, from the wider community. Um, and also not just the, the refugees who are here, but also the 40 million people who are left behind um, mm -hmm. also need um, the proper way of handling. I don't know what the right terms would be to say in these sort of situations, uh, uh, a proper human way of uh, being treated. So um, I thank you very much again for uh, coming on the show. Thank you very I, much uh, for having me. Yes, I wish you best of luck with your art. And um, where can people find your art? If you want to shout out your website, go for it. Yeah, so it's uh, resumprintcreations.com. And my Instagram handle is at resumprintcreations. And yeah, you can find me there. <laughs> there you go. OK. Uh, we'll put it in the description as well. And so thank you again. And uh, audiences, if you've enjoyed this conversation, there is more such conversations. Uh, please go ahead and listen to all of them. Get to know us, get to know our stories and connect with us. And once again, thank you very much, Saira John, for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Have a good one. You too.